Um, we have now 40 minutes for um, discussing uh, these questions on the panel, and we will then have another 40 minutes uh, with the um, uh, audience. So we have four questions, and I think there is um, actually, if you remember that cogwheels, yeah, that that three cogwheels that are of slightly different. Uh, I think that very much covers actually the three areas uh, we should uh, cover in this session here. And the very interesting thing I realized when I saw that slide first is that the economic cogwheel is the biggest one. And uh, I was wondering if this is then the reason that it runs at all or if it maybe is uh, the whole working cycle is run by the one in the lower left corner, which was, as you might remember, uh, the target one. So that is a little bit the question we just discussed in the briefing as well. Uh, how do we solve that? From where do we go? And uh, I think when we start with the second question, here it says, do you agree that a detailed accounting of what availability and demand taking into account ecological requirements is a precondition for allocation of water resources being uh, between sectors? Probably each of you then answer only yes or no. So I would like it as an open question. What are key requirements to ensure fair and sustainable allocation, sustainable allocation uh, meaning uh, accounting for ecosystem requirements. What do we have on stake there? What do we need in terms of knowledge base uh, and what else? And I would like to go that way down, so would like to start with uh, Conchita, please. Okay, uh, of course one of the main requirements is to know how much water we have if we want to manage it. So uh, in that sense, the water accounting is, should be, I think, a top priority in any water planning process. Nobody can manage any water good if we don't know how much of that good we have and how we, are, we can use it. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, a very uh, important piece of work in any water planning, not in vain in many countries, such as my country, which is water scarce. Uh, this exercise has been long time, for a long time done. It, it, the recent, most, most recent milestone in this, or, more, or one of the milestones in this exercise was the uh, white paper of waters in Spain, which was developed on, in the la late 19s. That was a very important pillar for knowing how much water the basins can provide to the users. And uh, there, are, there have been also other initiatives in water balances at uh, Mediterranean, Mediterranean basins and in other countries which have been water scarce as well. So um, in that sense, the initiative of the Commission is not new, but uh, the new in, or the innovation in this uh, water accounting process is the, uh, that the European agency is proposing to have a water accounting system based in the United Nations system of environmental economic accounting for water, which is considered a sound worldwide system, so which is considered a good system, and we agree with this. So it's quite welcome, I think, for most of the water balancers community, I think, and we should encourage that process because it can ha help to uh, bridge some um, existing gaps in knowledge about uh, water availability in terms of uh, how much water is flowing in rivers, how much water is stored in the soil for several uh, different time scales, how much water is stored in reservoirs and how much uh, water is, uh, we can provide to users. And also it can provide knowledge about how much water can really be used for different economic uses and for the environment, for the benefit of the environment and the, uh, say, society. So um, uh, the water accounting is, in, the, in that sense, very useful in order to uh, bridge that, those gaps. Nevertheless, I think that the EEA should propose a model uh, which could be um, used for uh, all the countries in a practical way according to their, um, uh, their proper um, 
specificities in managing water, in particular regarding the scale issues. So uh, I think that uh, we can provide as much as many data we could we could have, but we have to provide them in a sort of a harmonized way, in a sort that can be affordable for companies or for basins to provide them in time and with a good quality. And, uh, um, and also that could uh, help to identify these gaps. So um, I think in that sense what Jack uh, has told about the role of the CIS process is interesting because the CIS can help to uh, promote this process in a coordinated way between countries. So that's what, what I wanted to stay, state. Thank you very much, uh, Conchita. Um, I'm neutral here, um, so I won't say anything about EA accounting, but I know that the, that the colleagues are listening, so uh, we, we take that. But I think that the local thing is very important. Um, the economist, David, um, how do we allocate and what do we need to allocate? Oh, what do we need? Um, okay, so I think the, the, fir the second question was, uh, Accounting, yes, I agree with that. And and how do we, how are we going to do that? So I take it take as given that the, we have a good idea of physical flows, which unfortunately we don't today. But that is definitely a precondition to doing anything. And then uh, what I would do, or what I would recommend from an economic perspective, which is a perspective that is supposed to deliver efficiency and uh, equity or fairness, uh, is uh, I would recommend setting aside the environmental flows because those are not flows that should be subject to market forces or market pricing. This is a very controversial topic because in some countries e-flows are zero and in some countries e-flows are strained and some countries e-flows are adequate. But again, if you put that aside and then you have remaining water, this is again because of political will to uh, protect the environment, then you have a remainder of water which is going to be useful for economic purposes. There's um, uh, that water should be divided into two uh, uh, allocation mechanisms. One is what I traditionally call a bulk mechanism, which is something that farmers or agricultural users or, or, uh, uh, or would use, or the, the amount of water that would go down a river. And then there's the way you price water in an urban setting, which refl reflects uh, payment for services. Um, at, in, at, at, the, at the bulk level, uh, it is, there are different ways of doing it. Sometimes farmers are given water. Sometimes farmers pay the cost of delivery of their water. I just found out that Cyprus uh, gives farmers water at less than the cost. I would not recommend doing that. Uh, at the level, full cost recovery is obviously uh, an economically sustainable policy. That means you pay for the cost of capital, the cost of maintenance and operations, uh, and the cost of uh, uh, additional improvements to the system. Most parts of the world do not reach this standard. And then in addition, in water-scarce places, the cost should reflect the price of the resource, which means that when water is abundant, I, I, I live in the Netherlands, so water is abundant, the abundance resource price of water should be zero, but where water is scarce, the price of water should be higher. Of course, what we know is that in most cases of the world, and as well as in Europe, the price of water is actually lower for urban use. It's lower than uh, the, not just the cost of delivery, but it's lower in the southern states where water is scarce and higher in the northern states where water is expensive because of the cost of service, right? That's why Copenhagen has the most expensive water in Europe and the southern states have the cheapest water in Europe. So from an economic perspective, we need to have that priced uh, at a correct level and then we're going to get efficiency. This is, uh, I think, well understood. People that argue against that essentially say we should be giving away a resource for less than its cost um, and, and that's going to lead to overconsumption. And more importantly, in the case of water, it's going to lead to uh, taking water not just out of the environment but out of our futures. And anywhere where you have groundwater levels dropping, you'll know that there's not going to be water there for uh, a non-rainy day when you need it. Um, and I'll stop there for just now. Yeah. Thanks a lot. David said, I might remind, uh, there is something that is not to be regulated by the market. <laughs> yeah? So? <laughs> No, you, you started with that statement, flows, environmental uh, flows yeah, yeah. are something that is outside the market. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah? We don't know how exactly, exactly.
good. Um, Kyriakos, um, allocation in Cyprus. Okay, we feel that the proposal of the EA and the European Commission for a uniform model of water accounts across Europe is promising. Uh, however, as already mentioned, many countries, especially water scarce countries, already base management and allocation of water uh, on water balances developed for each river basin. Already do that. For example, from the Cyprus experience, water allocation for the two main sectors, which is uh, irrigation and domestic supply, plus the environment, is standard practice in order to optimize the use of available quantities of water. The basic tool for this procedure is the existence of water accounts. Of course, our system needs further improvement by employing new technology and, and other innovative techniques to face extreme unexpected scenarios. It is noted that to be able to produce water balances, monitoring is essential, and in many water scarce countries, this is to a great extent in place. Any improvements in the methodology will be a, of great help. The water accounts developed at EU level will provide the missing link for water managers to proceed to realistic allocation policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, should we continue? Werner would like to say something on that as well. Okay. Uh, to be frank, for me, the water price, the water price we have in Germany has nothing to do with uh, fairness or so. It had, uh, has only to do with cost. What costs the water to supply to the consumer and what, what costs it uh, to, to discharge. And this price we have to pay. Uh, this is so far easy. It's I agree that it's much more complicated in cases where you have not enough water. Uh, and I, I am not politician enough to present here a solution. That's all. To set first question. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we very, very naturally move on from from the the allocation question of course it's very closely related to uh, how are we how do we organize the economics around it how do we organize the price and how do we organize uh, the aspects of uh, water efficiency and what does what measure uh, cost um jack do you want to add anything on that so far no on the water accounts, yeah? <clears throat> I mean, no, very briefly that uh, what the different uh, panelists have been, have been saying is that what is important is that we uh, use this uh, EU system not as a centralized system, but as a way of uh, sharing all the information which is available. So ensuring that we use all what we have, which is a lot, sometimes a lot of information is available in the, in the basins, in the catchment at national level, but we are not able to retrieve it in a consistent way. And then the other interest of that is, as it was said already, is to highlight the knowledge gap and link it also to uh, monitoring. And for instance, what is a, a concern is the lack of information on the river flows that we have in most parts of, uh, of Europe when it's an, an essential calibration variable for the water accounts. If we don't know the flow in the river or the level of the groundwater, we will not be able to make this accounting. And then here, there is, I mean, it's a very important question, also with financing implication. Okay. Um, I think let's move on to the second question here on the list, the third questions, which is formulated do you agree that the support to the end of pipe water efficiency measures should be based on a proper assessment of its cost effectiveness taking into account the rebound effect? Sounds complicated. So we are up into the, the third small cogwheel in the upper right corner, the, the other small one next to the uh, ecological target. Um, and 
I think that is a question uh, I would like to uh, let uh, Werner start with. The end of pipe water efficiency measures how do we get them most cost effective? Most cost effective? Do we need rules? Do we need uh, uh, agreement? Do we need a regulation on that, or can we regulate that uh, via a price and via uh, the allocation? Okay. Now we come uh, to the end of pipe. Uh, End of the, to the products at the end of the pipeline. These I know, and uh, but uh, here I'm uh, a little uh, exotic person, and uh, we have a, a little exotic uh, point because before we discussed always about uh, river management, river basin management. We discussed about uh, uh, then huge uh, water demands and huge water uses and we heard about products like uh, power pl power plants and so and my products uh, are at the end of the line and they are very small and uh, seems to be easy to handle but everybody of you knows use these products and you use and the, the, the the product itself, and but more uh, your use of the product uh, depends or gives you at the end of the day or at the end of the year your bill, your yearly bill for your water costs and for your energy costs. Uh, I have to say again, uh, uh, additional to these products in the last 30 years the standards for these products required a minimum delivery as much as as much as you deliver as better was the product was expected the product now situation changes we the discussion about water saving uh, we had have now since about two or three years, three years uh, in our standardiz standardization committees and uh, slowly uh, we could develop changings in the standard which allow officially products with using less water. During this time or since longer time industry has already developed these products so these are available these are also available in the market and the company I work for uh, delivers since about 10 years products which delivers less than the standard requirements and since two years we uh, reduced these values again especially for taps I have here to explain when I speak here from taps I mean especially the water uh, the water basin taps the basin taps it makes no sense uh, to save water or to try to save water with a tap for the bathtub filling you must fill the bathtub nothing else then you have to discuss is the bathtub bigger or should this be bigger or less and uh, the second product for this product for these basin mixers it is relatively easy to produce it uh, with less water consumption. It's to decide what is you, uh, reasonable, how, how, how much water do you need or do you want. But, uh, and also I have to say these products are not efficient. The old was not efficient and the new are not efficient. These are on-off products you open it and as long you open it water flows this has nothing to do with efficiency you can measure efficiency for a motor energy you put in and energy goes out but not for these products this, but this only uh, reductional this is a wrong word the efficiency for these products water efficiency 
Okay, basin mixers are relatively easy to reduce to a certain amount. Uh, more difficult is it with showers. If I use a shower, I need, uh, uh, I will wash me. I will wash my body, my hairs. When I was young, I needed a lot of water to wash my hairs. Now this changed. <laughs> when I look around here now, uh, more than half of the people have a lot of hairs. They need water to wash their hairs. <laughs> because roughly half are women. <laughs> okay, for these products, we have to consider what is, what is good or what is useful. And uh, it's not efficient to reduce it to a minimum value because you only lead, need longer for your washing process and you need this may be the same amount of water than with a product which delivers a little more per minute. But I am sure also here we can come to a compromise and we can come uh, and there are products on the lowest end from the useful delivery and in the middle end and there are also products on the high end but the products on the very high end, uh, this, this you can uh, compare with, a, if you compare a Golf with a Porsche, you have a lot of Golfs, but less Porsche, so the consumption of the Porsche or the shower, which you have <coughs> big over you, uh, this doesn't uh, give reasonable amount of water when you see it in the total. So, now I have lost <laughs> the line. <laughs> no? Okay, good. Uh, what I will say, industry can deliver products and so the products are already in the market. Uh, and when we talk about these, product, uh, these shower heads and taps and shower heads, we have also to consider uh, these products are intended and used with, intended to use with hot water or with warm water, with heated up water, and they are used for this. And so uh, every liter of water we save is uh, any amount of energy. It's a di direct relation. It's only uh, one factor, one mathematic factor in principle. Okay. Uh, what we okay, we have the products. What we need, what is the problem to introduce it in a, in a broad way uh, and and quick introduc introduction in in the whole Europe is a problem. We are faced with a lot of uh, different requirements in different countries, and this is. One thing what hinders us, or what hinders not only us, also the industry, uh, to implement it quicker. And therefore, maybe EU can help us uh, by, I will say, uh, by reducing the national, the national obstacles. We know that uh, they cannot do it uh, quickly, but perhaps they can help. We need no new requirements. So in principle, is all is set and all is done, and we have a lot of, unfortunately, we get now more and more labels, water labels, energy labels uh, for our products, and this doesn't really help us because all this, <laughs> all these labels or a lot of these labels are confusing and, and as more we have, as more confusion we have. So when we can get rid of this and can get clarity, 
This would help to introduce these products, these water saving products, and so this would improve this process. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that's clear. Clear guidelines, continuous, clear, continuous requirements. Uh, how does it look in the uh, agriculture side? There we have the similar problem, I guess. Maybe you keep short? Short. I'll yeah? Try, try short. <laughs> for, okay, for many countries where irrigation is the main consumer, mm -hmm. the main end of pipe water efficiency measure is the improvement of the, of the on farm equipment like the installation of advanced irrigation systems, which is the farmer's responsibility. However, our experience in Cyprus shows that the initial investment costs, as well as the relevant technical advice for the installation of on-farm irrigation system, could be supported in order to give the necessary motion to the acceptance and establishment of the measure towards water use efficiency. Mm -hmm. In practice, the installation of on-farm advanced irrigation systems in some rural areas of Cyprus was funded during the 80s and 90s in a framework of a number of rural development projects supported by the UN and funded by the International Bank of Reconstruction and Development and the European Investment Bank. The result was the wide acceptance of those systems and their application by all farmers over the country while a number of advisory firms specialized in the field became gradually active in the local market. Today, all farmers in Cyprus use advanced irrigation technologies bearing the relevant full cost of installation and maintenance. These technologies are also widely used for irrigation of the recreational decorative green areas. At the same time, the installation of water meters was also funded and water metering became a standard procedure in the governmental irrigation networks as the most appropriate method for water billing. The decision for supporting the end of pipe water efficiency measures should be based on a cost effectiveness analysis, taking into consideration the value of water as an economic and environmental good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, David. I, I want to uh, make some comments relevant to both farmers and to showerhead manufacturers. Yeah. Um, the law of demand in economics is probably something that you stopped listening as soon as you heard this law word, but it's something that we all experience every day, and it basically says that if something gets more expensive, we find ways of using less of it. And as an example, I like to tell people about how the price of water in Amsterdam is five times the price of water in Las Vegas, which is in the middle of the desert, and Amsterdam, remember, is in the middle of a pond of water whereas the water consumption in Las Vegas is five times the water consumption of Amsterdam. This is a pretty good example of the law of demand. Now, what we tend to say as economists is just raise the price and people will find a way of using less. The one way of saying that is they will find different techniques and different technologies. So they might have a shower head that puts too much water out, but they might take a shorter shower or they will uh, not flush the toilet twice because it's, manufactured, it's not manufactured for it's a low flush toilet because they, are rather, they would rather pay the price, for example. So as far as farmers are concerned and this so-called rebound effect and these efficiency measures, especially when it comes to farmers asking for subsidies to be uh, uh, incentivized to install the efficiency measures, I'll say this. It's almost universally true that farmers with more efficient irrigation systems will use all of the water that is left over from that efficiency to grow more crops. That's because farmers use water to make money. So if you want them to use less water, you should charge them more for their water, not charge them less than the cost for water. Another way of doing that, of course, which economists love, is water markets and water trading, but that might be difficult to implement immediately. As far as the showery, uh, showerhead manufacturing business is concerned, I have a simple recommendation, which is that we don't have regulations on high flow, low flow, the color, uh, the shape of the showerhead. If water is expensive, people will use less water. And if they want to buy a showerhead that lets them have 100 liters a minute on their body, then they will pay that cost of that showerhead. If they want to buy a low flow showerhead, they will. And if any of, if any of you have ever gone to a campground where you have to put in a one euro coin, for a three-minute shower, you'll know how fast you get very economical with water. Just think of that. If you go home to your shower and you have to put in one euro coins every few minutes, you'll find out very quickly that expensive water will be conserved. 
You don't need to tell somebody what regulation, was, what ISO, what anything or other thing label they have to have on their shower head or their kitchen tap or the size of their tub. So that would relieve a lot, uh, a lot of uh, manufacturers and a lot of consumers of burdensome regulation that does nothing at all. I think I'll stop there. Okay. Good. Um, Conchita, would you like to add on that? From a Spanish perspective? Oh, well, uh, very briefly, uh, I think that efficiency is an issue that uh, is, should, be, um, should be taken in everything we do, so, uh, as well as under water use. I think that the maximization of efficiency, is, as much as possible, is a good thing because it uh, provides uh, improvement in technology and that uh, creates uh, room for innovation and also induces to, to use less water as well. And uh, regarding coming to the uh, rebound, of course, the farmers, which are, I think they are more addressed by this issue, farmers will all, all, always uh, uh, take advantage of their incentives in efficiency because they will get more water for cropping more things. So in that sense, cropping more uh, food. So in that sense, I think that um, we have to, well, I have a question to myself, which is who gains with the efficiency measures? Who is gaining with this? Who are the losers? Who are the winners? If we improve efficiency, who pays for that? Mm? And I think that uh, we should uh, use uh, tools such as uh, cost-effective assessments or multi-criteria studies in order to see how are the benefits of proving efficiency in all economic sectors. Okay, thank you. I think we, we, we need to make sure, this is why we are here environmentalists, that the environment gains too, and not okay, only, of course, yeah. Yes. Um, we are coming to the economic part, the third set of, of uh, the third question. Uh, hmm? comments to Please. My colleague here, um, good proposal. When the price for the water and the energy maybe, uh, which is used to heat up the water, is high enough, we don't need to regulate the products. It's the uh, market regulates it itself. Maybe that's one interim uh, idea. Maybe the uh, um, uh, um, building regulation, after all, is not not absolutely uh, important. The uh, eco design directive, um, the economic bit. What we see so far here from the panel that obviously. Um, next to the ecological flows, the ecological requirement, the market, economic, uh, can regulate a lot. Though obviously right now it does, doesn't do it. And uh, we have a question here uh, to answer, which I would then start with, with David to answer. What are your views on the main barriers for the implementation of fair and efficient pricing. And let's take that directly together with the last question. In terms of knowledge base, do you agree or what are the priorities that should be given uh, to proper assessment of cost benefits um, of implementation or non-implementation of the Water Framework Directive? So the different elements of the, of the economics, the, the uh, incentives, the pricing, uh, but also the recovery part. Um, David. Um, so the answer to your question about the barriers to uh, what into efficiency, in a sense, or to a good use of our resources, they're not economic. Uh, to the pricing scheme as pricing. well, really in the water framework. The, the the barriers to pricing in the water framework directive and other other types of economic use of water. It's uh, it's po those are political barriers. They're not economic barriers. I think um, we've known the economics for a long time. Everybody in the room probably knows the economics. Um, in some countries or places, maybe they don't, I have a book. Um, in some places, uh, there is a culture of overuse, um, and mo there is a very uh, strong problem with subsidies that encourage overuse. Uh, I oh, by the way, 
I, I, if, if you haven't figured it out, I come from the United States. And I'm very pleased that this dialogue is occurring here, and I'm, I'm, I'm desperate that the, I'm a, I'm a dual citizen. I'm desperate that the EU is not more um, bad at managing water than the United States. So you guys are neck and neck uh, in terms of going down. Let's, well, I want us to, you know, the EU should do better. So in a sense, there's subsidies in the U.S. just like there are subsidies in Europe that distort uh, uh, water decisions, whether that's a subsidy to a domestic user in Las Vegas who's taking water out of a river that does not reach the Gulf of um, California in Mexico, whether it's a subsidy to a farmer in the middle Midwest who is growing corn for biofuels and destroying not just the groundwater but also the ecosystem, whether it's a subsidy to an olive farmer in Spain or uh, to an olive farmer in Greece. Uh, <laughs> there are subsidies that are changing these behaviors, and um, I'll get to the economics of how to address that in a second. Um, but these misallocations, they're, of course, they're costly, and they're costly, as I mentioned earlier, to 98% of the people who may not be paying attention, and the 2% of people who are paying attention who are receiving those subsidies really like getting those subsidies. So the politics is the problem of the majority essentially finding a way to get their money back from the minority. The problem, uh, as well as cash transfers, is that, and I think this is quite an interesting problem, is that uh, many areas where they are over-abstracting water are not even of interest to the EU. They, those are, in a sub, from a subsidiarity perspective, uh, those people are making their own trouble for themselves in the future. And often I think there's two solutions. One is they, there's three solutions. One is they actually uh, hope that they're going to be bailed out by somebody bringing them more water in the future. That happens when you have large uh, canals or transit systems bringing water from one system to another. We see that in most countries in the world. Or they uh, intend to retire before their children go into the business. Uh, or um, they actually don't even pay attention to the future because they are really pressed right now. And that's a possibility. But uh, unfortunately, most of the people who are going to suffer from misuse of water are going to be people who live in the areas that are water stressed. So, um, and, and, and also let me point out that this is not just about water quantity. I live in the Netherlands, which I notice has a record number of exemptions from water quality regulations. I think their domestic farm lobby is uh, constantly not in the at the table having a discussion. I've, I've mentioned this, I think, to the Prince of Orange, who nods his head and walks away. So unfortunately, these problems occur at different levels in every place. So those are the politics. And how would I resolve it? I mentioned earlier uh, uh, about using uh, pricing uh, for domestic water and uh, markets or any kind of uh, pricing change for farmers, depending on how they get their water. Uh, I would also think uh, I would add uh, my word or to this idea of, of cross-linkage. Is that the word for it? Between uh, the common agricultural policy funds. I, of course, think that uh, no, no, no cap money should be dispersed to any area which is not actually reporting their water use, nor any area which is under water stress. That money, I don't think the money should go back to the other areas. That money could be used for technical experts who will then bring those areas up to uh, compliance, which means that all the local consultants will still get paid, and the countries cannot complain they're not getting their share of the cap money. I'll stop there for now. Okay. Thanks. Um, Kyriakos. On the economics, what are barriers for implementation and cost benefits? Right. The barriers. Uh, first of all, let me say that access to good quality water is a basic human right, fundamental for survival and human health. Through the centuries, water was considered to be a blessing from God, a gift from nature. Uh, thus, even today, people believe that water should be provided to all at no cost or at, ver at a very low cost. This is the first barrier. Second, because what is necessary for every social and economic activity, water manager, management is often a matter of policy decision. In most countries, pricing policies need to be, need the necessary political will for implementation. That is very important. Thirdly, price elasticity of demand for water is very low in some countries, especially water scarce regions where well, water quantities available are limited anyway. There is no room for considerable further water saving. Even if you increase the price, there is no more saving. Therefore, elasticity zero or close to zero, and pricing cannot act as a barrier to consumption any further. 
Uh, the fourth barrier, pricing should be applied together with other relevant, uh, other, sorry, other related demand management measures in order to give the right signal to consumers. For example, metering and volumetric pricing and people's education and awareness to accept water as a social as, a social, as well as an economic good. Pricing policies should make the people use water efficiently, thus the goal of pricing should be to make the users introduce water efficient technologies and practices as already discussed. However, a more comprehensive approach is needed from the governments in order to make these alternatives available, accessible and affordable. And lastly, on the issue of um, uh, knowledge base, the assessment of the costs and benefits of the non implementation of the Water Framework Directive is very interesting. It's a very interesting issue and it should be investigated further. The knowledge base therefore needs to be enhanced and further research is needed at EU level. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to go soon now into the um, discussion with the audience. Uh, Vanna, very shortly, uh, would you like to add something on that economic side? I mean, uh, it's obviously uh, how, how much uh, I was thinking about the electricity, elasticity of, of demand. There is, of course, something I can do with the efficiency technology because it moves um, the, the this is the elasticity of demand. Yeah, okay. Uh, by sure, improvement moves always. But uh, on the level we have now, uh, we can deliver all what is needed. And we, what we need from EU, please hear carefully. <laughs> we don't require uh, fundings and we don't require uh, fundings for development and uh, in, in, inventions. This we can do ourselves. We need stable framework, stable political framework and stable requirements. Best, same in all member states. This would help enough. Clear message. David, really? Audience turn. Very, very quickly, yeah, because uh, Kiriako said two same things that were interesting. He said, talk about the human right to water and that water should be free and we got used to water being free. And, and as some people have noticed, you know, when you go to a city and the parking places become more and more expensive because there's not very many parking places or there's fixed amount of parking places and more and more cars. And we've got the same problem with water in many places, right? Water should be free when it's abundant. If you go to the Netherlands, you can have as much water as you want. When you go to Greece, you're probably going to have to pay for your water. The other thing I wanted to mention that's quite important is that if there is no room for savings, so you actually said price doesn't have an effect, and then you said price has an effect, but I'll, it depends, okay. right? So if there is no room for saving, uh, then some places are going to have to reduce their agricultural sector, okay? And I looked up uh, earlier because the, the, the minister uh, from Cyprus talked about water use. I, lo I took a look at, took up a, took, looked at a paper from the, uh, some two, uh, two scholars from the Cyprus University of Technology in Greece, 83% of the water used for agriculture. Cyprus, 69% agriculture. Desalination, remember. 68% in Spain, 57% in Italy, and 52% in Portugal. And those sectors are going to shrink if there is no elasticity, for example. There will be fewer farmers or there will be more farmers on less land, more importantly. And that is a fact. Unless, of course, the city people want to evacuate and go live in Berlin or something. Okay. With that, I go to the audience. Maybe you have uh, some reactions uh, on that, please. There is, yes, the lady in the third row. My name Say is, your name, yeah, please, and starting. your attitude. <laughs> My name is Natasha Morsi from the International Office for Water. But on this particular discussion, I think I'm more going to react as a citizen than more than my, uh, my office, in the name of my office. I have to admit I'm a bit scared when I hear what you've said, that with the money we can regulate everything. And that is true from an economic point of view, that the money, the price is going to have an influence on the action of people. But 
We also know from an economic point of view, when we have efficiency, it doesn't mean at all we have equity. So how do you take into account the fair aspect in your first question? I can really understand the economic point of view, but I've, you know, so that would be my question addressed to the panel. You are collect some questions. Here was uh, in the second row, please. Thank you. Sean Kier from the Danish Ministry of Environment, being the Permanent Secretary Deputy. Uh, to congratulate you with this uh, very important discussion. And um, I guess we could put it that way, we consider it extremely important that the water protection and water use are approached in an integrated policy. Um, so, and I think <clears throat> that we have a particular interest in water pricing as a road to to improve protection and efficient use of water resources at the same time. It's a big job, as also the discussion <laughs> up there uh, indicates. We need to plan for water use, we need to measure water use, or at least estimate the water use, and then build a system to put a value to water, and then create incentives to use the resource as efficiently as possible. Pricing of water should then change the consumer's behavior and attract uh, companies and creative persons to develop water-saving technologies. And the efficient use of resources and development of better methodologies and technologies are central elements in the transition to a green economy. And I think it's very important that we have this, this overall perspective ahead of us because <clears throat> equal to energy, water is a very important raw material to production of goods and services. So water policy is for quality and availability and efficient use will prove to be important to the overall societal goals for the green economy, contributing to growth and, creation and the creation of new jobs. So that's an important part of it as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I take one more question, the lady over there in the middle, yeah. Uh, thank you. My name is Clary Papazog, Lou Bird Life Cyprus, an environmental NGO. Uh, I'd like to uh, support very much what uh, Dr. Zetland has uh, said about uh, pricing. Uh, I think another thing uh, I would say for the Cyprus uh, context especially is that um, by increasing the price, uh, the responsible authorities can also have more money to tackle some of the other uh, problems, which is, for example, a very important problem that was not mentioned uh, the more than 50,000 illegal wells operating in Cyprus at the moment, uh, where farmers are getting actually water for free, not even paying a small amount, um, as well as the environmental costs, which at the moment are not being tackled, and things like restoration of wetlands, which can help for flooding and all sorts of other um, issues, and biodiversity, of course. And by increasing the price, it makes uh, water that is available from uh, recycling much more attractive because the prices start to become much more similar. Uh, whereas if you, if you compare free with a little bit expensive, of course, the free is always uh, better. Um, and also it can push diversification of crops or even changing of crops because if some crops are no longer sustainable then uh, th that change has to happen. It's better if it happens sooner than later. But I have a question also for Dr. Zetland. Uh, clearly the countries in the north are paying much, much higher prices for water but from what we've seen also from the presentation from the Commission uh, in the beginning, they still have a lot of problems for implementing the water directive. So certainly, uh, water pricing is not the answer. It's not the silver bullet, let's, let, let's say. It's not the answer to everything. So what else has to be done? Fritz, directly to that, or should we first go to the panel? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. I think there were a, 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 a bunch of questions I, I heard about being scared of the economics, and uh, but a positive way. David, you probably first answer. I, I have four answers to four questions. So let me start with um, the equity efficiency question. Um, the first thing is that most water at, at, at most people's taps here costs on the order of, uh, let's say, one to three euros per thousand liters, right? Those bottles in front of you 
cost about one euro per liter. So, in fact, the cost of water to your tap is not going to make you die of thirst in many cases. If you're very concerned about this question, there's different ways of implementing pricing schemes. There are increasing block rates so that there is a, uh, for example, 50 liters per person per day is cheap, and then you pay more if you have an estate and a garden and a pool. So there's ways of structuring these tariffs with full cost recovery to indeed increase the incentive to conserve the water. I don't necessarily recommend using so, what the, those so-called social prices to deliver justice. I recommend using the taxation system to deliver justice so that poor people get income transfers and then they can use that for water or for, for petrol or for cigarettes or whatever they feel like. Um, secondly, uh, I wanted to point out, I, I forgot to mention that uh, rain-fed agriculture is not an evil idea. It is not as profitable as irrigated agriculture, but humans subsisted for thousands of years with rain-fed agriculture, and some parts of the world, some parts of the Mediterranean, will probably return to that style of irrigation. Uh, on the jobs, someone uh, said something about jobs, um, or, or they didn't, but I just heard it in my head. Uh, but I want to point out that uh, if you have subsidies going towards a preferred sector, whether it's the agricultural sector or it's the uh, I don't know, the, 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 the computer sector, whatever. If you have subsidies going to that sector and, and, and the subsidy is actually in the form of cheap water, then you're taking water away from other sectors that could be also producing jobs, right? So you're, it's not that you, you're saving jobs in the agricultural sector. You're taking away jobs in sectors that could use that water for better purposes. Um, on illegal wells, this is an extremely good point. Uh, as we heard already, I think uh, Spain has 10 times as many wells that are illegal. Uh, it is a good way to uh, uh, use those fees and so on for uh, a from, from streamlined paperwork. Uh, those fees should be used for uh, enforcement of the uh, laws. But of course, you have corruption and bribery. And I've, I'm a development economist and a water economist, so I know how that works. And I'll leave that to you. Um, there was, a, in, in the question of, of uh, problems in the north uh, in terms of uh, uh, the charts that we saw earlier and the high water prices, remember those high water prices tend to be uh, with regard to tap water, and most of the problems in the north are re with regard to water quality, which are usually from agricultural runoff. And though in that sense, uh, I, th I believe uh, Denmark has, for example, a fertilizer tax or a pesticide tax. Uh, they got rid of their fat tax, I heard, right? So. Uh, if you have uh, taxes on these products, people will use less of them, but most of the water qual quality problems uh, in the north are caused by uh, uh, agricultural uh, users discharging uh, contaminated tailwater. Uh, anybody else wants to answer on that first of, uh, audience question? Yeah, Kyriak, please. Um. I want to make some comments about the question uh, raised by Mrs. Babagosoglu. Um, what I want to say is that uh, um, the price of water um, for domestic needs uh, covers the full cost at this moment. Um, but uh, the price of water for the irrigation sector doesn't. Um, one very important thing I want to stress is that uh, if we do increase in a country like Cyprus the price of water for irrigation, uh, we are going to drive lots of farmers out of their jobs. They are going to abandon the land. And this is basically a, a social issue. We have to be very careful with that. Uh, and also on the issue of the environmental cost, let me first uh, make a comment about the illegal boreholes in Cyprus. Yes, we have lots of illegal boreholes. Uh, we have a very big problem. Uh, it is extremely difficult to tackle this issue. Uh, but let me say that the cost of water out of these illegal, illegal boreholes is much higher than the cost of water from the government projects. Um, when the bill um, that relates to Article 9 of the Water Framework Direv Directive is passed, uh, people are going to pay for um, the environmental cost and the resource cost as well. Um, that's it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, Fritz, first. I find this discussion extremely important, and uh, I would join the uh, the comments uh, made by uh, my Danish colleague. 
but uh, my feeling is if, if I follow the discussion and, uh, and listen to the so-called solutions, I call it the so-called solutions, then my feeling is that uh, if we are not able to produce other solutions, now we endeavoured the issue of market pricing in the water field. And we are discussing this issue in a way I would call the all-in-one-device suitable for every purpose. And I think we have to be really careful what we can do through water pricing and what we cannot do through water pricing. And to be clear, domestic use is peanuts, uh, if you like to, uh, to, to uh, ensure more water availability. This is 2%, 4%, uh, it's below 5%, it depends. And uh, it is clear if you like to change something, then you have to go primarily for agriculture and secondly for industry. But if you go for industry, you can really see, especially in, within the European Union, that in the last 20 years, the water intensive industry developed a lot of technical solutions to avoid being charged for, uh, for uh, water consumption. So I think we have to discuss this issue, but we have to be careful what uh, Kuko said. Uh, for a household, uh, the, uh, the price elasticity is close to zero if you are in, an, uh, in a specific situation. This applies also for parts uh, of agriculture. And uh, what we didn't discuss in the last panel, I, I would like to, to, raise, to raise here. If we are not able, especially in the arid and semi-arid areas of the European Union, to come to a kind of regulation in the water field, then there is no need to uh, save domestic water, because uh, domestic will be the far end of a long chain, which is at the end uh, not having enough water. Uh, if you go around uh, in parts of these areas, uh, then it's clear that uh, in the domestic field, you cannot really earn amounts of water they, uh, they uh, are available for other purposes. And this is the only point, if we are discussing economics, let us discuss economics in fields where economics are efficient, but not in fields where economics is senseless. Thank you very much. Um, one more question to add to that, that maybe gives them to... Yeah, um, a, a comment and an observation and then a question at the end. Um, I'm Hugh Goldsmith, I'm Head of Water at the European Investment Bank. So we look at uh, water projects all over Europe and we usually do um, an economic and financial analysis of them. Um, what you learn is that uh, all over Europe there's a huge, huge diversity of approaches to pricing and that pricing is essentially historic and that change in pricing is hugely political. So, um, so where you want to go to and how you're going to change things is a political process. And what we haven't heard so far in this afternoon's session is, a, a, is going back to what was said in a previous session about the three T's. The three T's was a framework for trying to be transparent about what's being recovered through prices what's being recovered through taxes and what's being subsidised from some external source. So um, the, one of the ideas of the Water Framework Directive 
as I understood it, was that there was supposed to be an economic analysis at a river basin level. And the river basin level, you have to look at uh, intersectoral allocation of water. And a three T's framework would give you some transparency and clarity, at least what the decisions that are being taken now about pricing and about efficient allocation are. So what I'd like to ask the panel, perhaps um, the, the gentleman from the, the Commission, is you've done this analysis of all the river basin plans across Europe. We've heard about the, 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 the bad performers who haven't even submitted plans yet. We've seen the red points on the map. We've seen the greys of no data. Uh, and so it seems that there's quite a lot of failure of whoever it is who's supposed to be preparing the river basin management plans. But the other thing I was supposed to do was do an economic analysis. So what are the good cases you've got to tell us about how good economic analysis is being used to achieve uh, the objectives of the framework directive, which are good ecological status of waters? Thanks. I would like to take these two contributions and uh, go back to the, to the panel and start with Jack. Is that okay? Yeah. No, thanks. I think it's a, very, it's a very good question because what, I mean, if you remember the, the presentation, I mean, I, when speaking about pricing, the first word I used and I insisted on is transparency. And what we have so far in the, um, in the report, in the river basin management plans, so what has been reported to the Commission is a very weak level of economic analysis, in particular when it uh, relates to the quantitative aspect of, uh, of water management. So this is why now we want to um, launch this, uh, this work on building water accounts and at the same, at EU level, and at the same time, gather information from different river basins where we have seen that these water accounts were, were built. So there are good examples in France, in, uh, in Spain, for instance, of, of this. We have, we are also developing uh, with the GRC, this is a hydroeconomic model, which is, I mean, a partial way, but it's at least a way of having this integrated perspective that the uh, gentleman from uh, the Danish Ministry was referring before. I mean, we need this framework to understand how the water is used by the different sectors. So far, the information is very bad on what is, the, for instance, on the share of the water which is abstracted, which is actually consumed. I mean, this is, we are, I mean, dealing with a lot of uh, um, ratios taking from here and there and which do not correspond to the reality. So we need a much better understanding of that. And here again, we have good examples of, uh, of sectoral models. I mean, we are working together, for instance, with uh, Euroelectric in order to uh, improve this database in the, in the energy sector. So this will be, I mean, with this process, we want to arrive at a situation in three years' time where this economic analysis is put at the place it deserves in the next uh, river basin management plan because so far it's uh, almost absent. Okay, and who else, David? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, briefly on the second question, then I'll go back to Fritz's excellent question. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I'm, and I, I'm not speaking about the, the basin plans, but I, I think that what, uh, what economists would keep track here is, is of the, the opportunity costs of misallocation. And we know, I have many, many examples I can tell you of these opportunity costs in terms of political rhetoric and massive subsidies for the wrong kinds of technology and so on. And then you can look at other places where water markets, for example, are more active and you see farmers who are switching from lower value or lower profit crops to higher profit crops. Use, maximizing the benefit of the scarce amount of water. So when we see the water allocation working, we see some good results. Where we see the lack of water allocation, we see many bad results. But that, again, is, is not speaking at all for these reports. But I, I would be very interested in, in repeat, uh, reading what you're asking for. Uh, regarding Fritz's comment, of course, I totally agree. I'm a political co economist. Uh, and I, maybe I skated too quickly over the, the political side of water allocation, right? So I initially said e-flows will be reserved in a political process outside of the economic process. And that's with respect to, as I mentioned before, bulk water. Uh, then you can have, a, a, for example, a, a, some kind of agricultural allocation of, of water, weather, and, and, and this is the thing that I think most people miss, is that subsidies keep 
not just bad businesses in place, whether it's a car manufacturer or, a, or a, 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 any other kind of business, but subsidies keep bad farmers in business, right? And if the, if the subsidies go away or if there were a market for reallocation of water among farmers, right, so it's not going to the cities, it's just one farmer to another, then the good farmers would stay in business. The good farmers would continue to grow European food so you don't have to buy food from the foreigners. And then the, the water would be used in a, in a sustainable way. That's an economic side. On the political side, the human right to water, for example, or social water tariffs, which I don't agree with, but if you want to make sure that poor people, there are no, technically, by the way, nobody in the EU reach, is, is too poor to afford water at the tariffs right now, by the way. Go to Africa if you want to talk about poverty. But if you, if you even still want to make sure that poor people can afford water, then you would do an, a, a, an income tax transfer. A political process will result in an income tax transfer, a negative income tax. On the other hand, full cost recovery is super important for water services. And if you want your water utility to be in business in 20 or 30 years, you make sure they can recover their costs. I also want to, to re respond to the, to the farmers who are being given subsidized water because what would happen? if we don't have those farmers. Well, what happened to the steel workers? And what happened to the car workers? You know, bad news, they went out of business because they could not be subsidized to stay in business. Those manufacturers went out of business. And in some cases, some farmers are going to be peripheral and they should not be farming anymore. Some of the land that was uh, farmed that was not farmed in the most recent uh, 10 years, potentially due to cap subsidies, will go back to being fallow land or rain-fed land, as I mentioned before. That's my comment about politics and economics. We still have some more time for more questions for this. Oh, yeah, there was a, the lady here. Yes, I'm Teresa Morga from the uh, Council of European Municipalities and Regions. Um, we did discuss also this uh, subject. And um, I want to stress one point, well, two points. Um, from the municipalities and regions, point of view, it's not possible to have an open market on water pricing uh, because it's a public re uh, uh, responsibility and uh, the knowledge of um, how to address um, water will be lost with the public uh, as administration and this will give a lot of uh, problems if it will go wrong with the, well, market. Uh, the second um, point I want to um, stress is there cannot be any kind of uh, a level playing field. Um, the, uh, well, the blueprint promotes that as well, so n n nothing one side in any um, a subject mentioned in the blueprint, there is no uh, one-size-fits-all, but uh, we are a little bit concerned if this is also uh, the case in uh, all the guidances and methodologies that will be stressed. So how will the Commission um, well, support this also in the guidances? Is that a similar you have there? I have a uh, somewhat similar. I was going to respond to several things. If you want to take that question first. Then. First, please answer to your direct question. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, the, I think making, a, making a guidance for the implementation of the Water Framework Directive, I don't think that it means a one-size-fits-all solution. I mean, it's exactly the opposite. I mean, what we want is to, I mean, ensure that we all understand the same thing from the from the water directive and its in its implementation and therefore that uh, the difference in the in the situation can be taken into account and it is where i mean in the in the cis i mean we have i mean obviously all the member states represented and all the the sectors and the ngos and the other institutions in order to to avoid uh, what we were we are just uh, referring to so Yeah, just a quick uh, response. I mean, the, in urban water services, it's the farthest thing on the planet from a market. 
right? It's highly regulated, whether it's run by a municipal water company or an investor-owned water utility, they're always, always, always regulated. I'm not talking about shooting all the regulators and letting the monopolists go for it. You know, I'm, this, is, this is a regulated place. And I would say the regulators should target full cost recovery so that they have a system in 50 years. Okay. I think the last question before we round up in the back there. I was just going to deal with a few issues and communication and regulation are some of them, but I'll start out with the communication. Sometimes when you're talking about water as an essential human right, you can say, yes, water could be considered an essential human right, but you can also say you have to pay for the delivery of that water in a certain quality. So that's one form of communicating the problem with water and the, the need for pricing of water. Um, Pricing also needs metering and monitoring, obviously. We've discussed that before. You can't, you can't do good pricing unless you have metering or monitoring. You have to know what, how much people are buying and selling. So that's, that's another important consideration, and that has to be established in many places. It hasn't been established, obviously, in many of the basins that we've been discussing where the problems are. Uh, often, price alone is, is not enough to stimulate change quickly enough. And this we can see in many different areas. The price of the higher prices of energy didn't really stimulate the if efficient appliances in energy, not uh, energy saving light bulbs, for instance. It had to be regulated in many places of the world. They had to say, okay, now you have to switch over to energy saving light bulbs. Uh, also, especially of things that are very expensive at the beginning but pay off in the long run, people often don't think about those those prices. The same is for water saving uh, appliances. The city of Boston in 10 years halved the demand for water resources and it was able to avoid building new water supply system. They did that not just by water pricing, although that was one mechanism, but they, they started with regulation. They started by saying, well, all, in, all new buildings have to have water saving appliances installed. And they, they used pricing mechanisms as well and leak, leakage detection. So there was a number of mechanisms, but water pricing alone wasn't enough to kickstart the process. And I think we have to keep that in mind when you're setting policy for the EU too. Okay, thank you very much um, for all these contributions in the audience. Uh, I would like to go round through the panels now, your very short kind of summary messages uh, you want to round up here. Um, start with Conchita. Well, uh, summary messages is my um, view that we uh, can put a better value to water if we know how much water it, it, it's available and how much water is used and all the methodologies we can use for knowing these are various. We can implement a methodology based on how much water is metered, how much water is not meter, metered, or um, how much water is available from modeling. I think there is a variety of technologies and we have to use the most appropriate technologies in order to have the knowledge on this. And I would like to support the last comment on water pricing because uh, the energy pricing is very important in the water supply. Efficiency in, in implies uh, energy consumption and energy has also price. So uh, uh, it's, it's been a fact in Spain that uh, farmers have to pay much more for the water because their prices of the price of the electricity have, have uh, increased a lot. So this should be taken into account when talking about uh, efficiency. Uh, again, on the last point, I, I, I think prices are fantastic, but I think that the, the thing to do, of course, is that prices and regulations should work together. I, again, going back to Las Vegas, they have this fantastically low price, and then they, then they pay you to not use the water. So this is not a good idea. You should send a signal which is complementary to regulations if you feel like it. Again, a non-price mechanism was in Brisbane in Australia in the middle of a drought. Everybody read in the newspaper, there's a drought, you should use less water. They immediately started using less water. Demand dropped by 50%. The price of water barely changed. So if you have social cohesion in your country, then you can make those kinds of announcements. And some places where social cohesion is, is weaker, you might need to use pricing. But in fact, all of these different mechanisms should reinforce each other. My summary comment uh, or a summary of how we should manage water, you should measure it so we know what we're doing. You should keep within the sustainable volumes, again, setting aside e-flows, and then the user should pay the full cost of their water. 
30 seconds. Water management needs an integrated approach, taking into account availability of water, efficiency, cost effectiveness, and economics. There is, of course, further room for improvement for end of pipe water efficiency measures, especially with the use of advanced irrigation systems. Effective pricing needs to be analyzed further, taking into consideration the local conditions and the very low elasticity that exists in water scarce countries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, your last word, Werner. So the industry I belong to can uh, contribute to water saving. This is clear. What we need are a stable framework. What we need, excuse me. What we need is a stable framework and not overloaded requirements. With overloaded, I mean overloaded with details which are not helpful and especially overloaded with uh, bureaucratic burdens. Then we can help the Commission without asking for additional fundings. So that's all. <clears throat> yes, I mean, we have not uh, actually spoken a lot about uh, cost and benefit analysis. I mean, I think it's, and uh, you will see in the, in the blueprint, it's something on which we want to pay a lot of attention over the coming years. I mean, first, because this is a way of understanding uh, the degree of cost recovery. I mean, comparing the level of uh, the, the price that are paid, I mean, it's, of course, it's interesting, but it's not what we, what we should aim at. I mean, we should understand, I mean, what are the, what are the costs of the water and the, pay, the price we pay so that we understand that what is this degree of cost recovery and this degree of cost recovery, it's not only an economic, economic question, it's also a political question, but we need, I mean, the, to uh, put all the data on the table. But it's not only for, for that that we should do cost and benefit analysis. We need also a better understanding and a wider understanding of the water use. I mean, water is also a competitiveness factor for a lot of sectors, I mean, for agriculture, for industry, for energy. And, and this is also uh, something in, on which we need to improve. Our, our knowledge, and I think it's also something important for the years to come. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, from my side, to try to summarize that, I would like to go back to that pictures of the cockwheel, remembering the economic cockwheel was the biggest one, and it is obviously a very important and big one. Uh, we need a lot of discussion about it, and we spent quite some time um, and the discussion on that, but it is not necessarily the one that runs it all because we need to have the target, the e-flow, the political process uh, as a very important tool uh, to drive the whole machinery and then there is a part uh, we can leave to the economy and the efficiency obviously we heard um, can be driven by price and it needs a stable framework. I think that's a very clear uh, message we got. And um, on the political side of the economies, uh, we obviously need a lot of more, more of discussion, maybe not only guidance, but communication and understanding, I wouldn't say streamlining, but, but a common understanding between member states and the, and the intense discussion process uh, on how we tackle it uh, on a European level between member states to have a common working framework on that. I think that's what we can give you for the blueprint from that session. And uh, thank you very much. I hope we are in time looking to LF3. <laughs> um, I have closing the session, the da -da -da practical announcement. People should bring their badges to access the venue on the second day. So please don't forget your badges tomorrow. And we will now have a transfer uh, to the hotels by bus and from the hotel to Famagusta Gate for the evening reception. You stay in your hotel probably 10 minutes or something like that. So okay. um, I don't know. Okay, session is closed. Thank you very much. See you have a nice evening. <laughs>